Zoax.net Existence and Uniqueness As promised, this video will look at spiritual matters in a very empirical way. What follows will be a very objective, reductionist look at the evidence of God's existence. The terms existence and uniqueness are typically used in proofs. However, here I will use them to indicate comparisons to secular entities and other religions. To say that there is evidence for something begs the question of what we accept as evidence. The evidence that I am presenting is not factually disputed. Rather, it is the interpretation that needs consideration, as well as some knowledge of statistics. With that in mind, I will cover some basic statistical concepts and keep it as non-technical as possible. If we roll a common six-sided die, each of the numbers one through six has a probability of one-sixth of coming up. That is, each number is an equally likely event. In this case, we say the distribution is uniform because the probability is the same over all values. If we roll two dice and sum the numbers that are rolled, an interesting thing happens. Each die still has a uniform distribution, however, the sum has a triangular distribution because there are many more ways to get a sum of, say, 7 than a sum of 12. So while 7 has a 1 6th chance of appearing, 12 has only a 1 36th chance. If we roll three dice and sum them, we get a distribution with a bump in the middle that tapers at each end. This distribution looks a little like a bell curve, which is what those who understand statistics would expect. The more dice that are summed, the more the distribution looks like the familiar bell curve. This is expected because the central limit theorem tells us that as we create sums like this, the result approaches a bell curve. Amazingly, this is true no matter what the type of distributions are that we use, even when the distributions are not the same shape. The central limit theorem explains why almost everything in statistics looks like a bell curve. Virtually all statistical distributions in the real world are the result of numerous factors that we cannot possibly account for. However, the central limit theorem tells us that we really do not have to account for them all. The resulting distribution will be very close to a bell curve regardless. All of this justifies my use of the bell curve. Now given a bell curve distribution, there are only two factors that we need to be concerned about, mean and standard deviation. The mean tells us where the center of the distribution is, and the standard deviation tells us how spread out the curve is. With these two factors, a bell curve is completely determined. The letters that are used to represent the mean and standard deviation are the Greek letters mu and sigma. So sigma measures the width of the curve, and it also is used to represent the distance from the mean, mu. For example, the IQ score for admittance into a high IQ club might be the top 2% of the population. This is roughly two standard deviations, or two sigma above the mean, and that is true regardless of the standard deviation. With respect to the recent discovery of the Higgs boson, Fermilabs posted a video to explain what five sigma means. I want to give them credit since they inspired some of my thinking in this video. As they mention, the Higgs boson particle is presumed to decay into various other combinations of particles with certain frequencies. The Higgs boson is never detected directly, but the presence of an unusual number of particles of various types is taken to indicate the presence of decaying Higgs bosons. With a large enough excess of these other particles detected, they conclude that the Higgs boson was found with a five sigma certainty. As they point out, science calls a discovery with three sigma certainty evidence and one with five sigma certainty in observation. And this discussion is intended to point out that this type of probabilistic evidence is used in science all the time. Moreover, there is also a parallel between God and the Higgs boson in that, even if we don't see either of them directly, we can still have evidence of their presence. This justifies my methodology. On the subject of God and the supernatural, it is common, particularly among atheists, to dismiss a belief in God as just one more superstition. On the surface, this seems perfectly reasonable. After all, many people over the course of history have claimed to be able to perform spells, use ESP, and a surprisingly large number have even claimed to be gods. Additionally, there are scores of mythologies and numerous deities that people have worshipped, so why should a logical person believe any one of them? 
More to the point, why would an atheist like me choose Catholicism over worshiping another god like Zeus or Odin? Is there a qualitative difference? I would say yes, and the answer lies in statistics. What does my god offer that Zeus, Odin, and the rest cannot? Well, the first obvious point is that my god still has an active church. In fact, after more than 3,000 years, the number of people worshiping my god is larger than it has ever been. The oldest writings of the Old Testament are estimated to have been written around 1000 BC or so. The original stories are estimated to be perhaps a bit older still. Christianity traces its origins to approximately 30 AD, but the books of the New Testament were written slightly later. Since then, Islam has developed as yet another outgrowth of Judaism. Today, Christians comprise roughly one-third, or 33% of the world's population. Muslims, the followers of Islam, make up another 21%. There are other religions that are derived from Judaism as well. However, all of these together with Judaism do not make a statistically significant sum. So if we add these numbers together, there is something like 54%, or a majority of the population, that worships the same God, and only that God, who will be referred to as the God of Abraham for clarity. Other religions have adherents, but a large number of the remainder are atheists, or religions that don't worship any god. Hinduism, which is sometimes considered the third largest religion, with 13%, has no central set of beliefs, and varies widely in its practice. It is probably a misnomer to call it a single religion, because it encompasses many different beliefs and gods. To summarize, there is no other god that comes close to the god of Abraham and the number of adherents. We could look at this historically over time too, and we would see that the worship of most other gods like Zeus or Odin began and ended with the particular cultures that they arose from. By contrast, the god of Abraham continues to grow in adherents even after 3,000 years. Whether we measure by population or time, the god of Abraham is a statistical anomaly. It would be difficult to gather exact figures, but I will throw out some rough numbers to show how it might work out. As I mentioned earlier, the God of Abraham currently has more than 3 billion adherents. So if we measure the number of adherents for all gods currently, and suppose that we have a mean of say 5 million, and a standard deviation or sigma of 1 million, then the God of Abraham is more than 3,000 sigma above the mean. Virtually any way you measure it, the God of Abraham is well beyond the 5 sigma level. This is true even if you choose a mean of 1.5 billion and a standard deviation of 300 million. So what does that measure? It measures how unusual the occurrence is. It measures the likelihood that this God is not merely one among many or an accident of men's minds like other gods. In short, it gives us evidence that there is something special and unique about this God, the God of Abraham. We can look at this in terms of time too. The God of Abraham has been worshipped for around 3,000 years or more, and is likely to go on for much longer. So if we take a mean of 500 years, and a standard deviation of 100 years, that leaves us at roughly 25 sigma above the mean. Even if we assume 1,500 years for the mean, and 300 years for the standard deviation, we are still above the 5 sigma level. I'm not presenting precise scientific measurements by any means, However, this does indicate that even if we make extremely large and obvious overestimates, we are still beyond the five sigma level. So the God of Abraham is unique among all gods, and that is a qualitative scientific assessment. So if someone tells me that my God is no different from the many others out there, that is a very unscientific statement. My God is uniquely, empirically, statistically significant among all gods, and that can be measured in many more ways than the two I've just mentioned. This compares the God of Abraham against other gods, but why should I believe that any God exists? In other words, how do God's institutions compare to man-made institutions? We can look historically at various empires. The Romans, the Greeks, the British. These are just the more successful ones. There are other empires like the Nazis and the Soviets that have had much shorter duration. We could compare these secular empires with Christianity, but it might be more consistent to compare them to the Catholic Church, 
which could reasonably be seen as an empire. We can follow the succession of popes, and we see that the Catholic Church is considered to be roughly 2,000 years old, beginning with St. Peter. The Roman Empire that put Jesus to death began in 27 BC and ended in 476 AD, so it lasted approximately 500 years. During that time, it tortured and killed many Christians. However, today the Catholic Church continues to grow larger than ever, while the Romans are long gone. I want to thank Father Robert Barron for illustrating this point nicely at the end of the first episode of his series on Catholicism. By the way, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. In the video, Father Robert Barron says, In April of 2005, the newly elected Pope Benedict XVI came onto the front loggia of St. Peter's Basilica to bless the crowds. Gathered around him on the adjoining balconies, there appeared all the cardinals who had just chosen him. The news cameras caught the remarkably pensive expression on the face of Cardinal Francis George of Chicago. When the cardinal returned home, reporters asked him what he was thinking about at that moment. Here's what he said. I was gazing over toward the Circus Maximus, toward the Palatine Hill where the Roman Empires once resided and reigned and looked down upon the persecution of Christians, and I thought, where are their successors? Where is the successor of Caesar Augustus? Where is the successor of Marcus Aurelius? And finally, who cares? But if you want to see the successor of Peter, he is right next to me smiling and waving at the crowds. Amid the growth of the church, many empires like the Romans have risen and fallen. We can throw out some rough numbers which are certain to be an overestimate. If we take, for example, the mean length of an empire to be a thousand years, and the standard deviation to be 200 years, the Catholic Church is five standard deviations above the mean. So the lifespan of the Catholic Church lies comfortably outside the expected lifespan of secular empires. Moreover, the Catholic Church is still alive, at its peak, and growing. So we should reasonably expect it to continue much longer into the future. For Catholics, the longevity of the Church is thought to be evidence of the fulfillment of the biblical verse, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, where Jesus says to Peter, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. For our last example, we can look at the Bible. Among all published books, the Bible stands as the all-time greatest in the number of copies printed. From its first publication, when Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press in 1450 AD, to the modern day, the Bible is estimated by some to have around 6 billion copies printed. It is difficult to make accurate estimates. Several different lists are out there with various estimates and the Bible is always at the top. The list that I will use was compiled by James Chapman and posted at squidoo.com. It estimates the number of books sold in the last 50 years. The top 10 of his list looks like this. The blue regions depict a bar graph of sales. As you can see, the Bible is the clear favorite with 3.9 billion copies sold. If we were to honestly estimate the mean and standard deviation of the number of copies printed per book, we would probably be very close to zero for both, since there are so many unsuccessful books. However, even at something as large as 150 million for the mean and 25 million for the standard deviation, the Bible is still more than 150 sigma above the mean. I have looked at four different measures related to the God of Abraham. The first two compared this God to gods of other religions. The last two compared him to secular counterparts. I could make many other comparisons as well. Admittedly, some of the numbers that I have used are crude estimates, but the basic facts that I have presented are not disputed. However, even with large overestimates, the God of Abraham is still well beyond the Five Sigma level. All of this points to the fact that, in the history of civilization, this God and the work of his adherents are by far the most significant event of all. Nothing else is even close. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that the events related to the God of Abraham are extraordinarily rare. In fact, an outcome above the Five Sigma level has a probability of 1 in 3.5 million. 
So all of this data points to the fact that this is not a simple accident of nature. There is something far beyond our understanding going on here. Either God exists, or the creators of these religions were simply brilliant beyond anything that we can imagine. At the very least, the religions of the God of Abraham comprise the greatest and most unique sociological and psychological phenomena in the history of the world. God's influence covers the earth. He impacts virtually everything and everyone. He is the closest thing we have seen in the human realm to eternal and omnipotent, and that is measurable.